Okay, welcome to North Church. <laughs> um, you're, well, I don't know if anybody else has joined us besides the ones that were just talking with us on the, on the Zoom, but um, several of us are actually here in the sanctuary, and next week we hope most of you will be here in the sanctuary, because we're going to be live here as a group. Um, I think it was mentioned Irwin's on, he's at a retreat um, with his covenant group, and we're welcoming our guest speaker. Um, Jonathan Sparks Franklin, he's director of UKIRK, um, which is the Presbytery's campus ministry at UC. And um, we're going to start. Uh, I invite you to uh, join responsively in uh, reading the words on the screen for the call to worship. Come all you people, come and worship. Made a come all creatures of the earth, come and worship. God has made a covenant with us. Remember the covenant and be thankful. God remembers the covenant and God will save us. Our first hymn is Morning Has Broken. Uh, which the worship team recorded in June of 2020. So it's a, a repeat. <laughs> um, the music, there's a musical introduction, and then the words will be on the screen.
Uh, please join me in the prayer of confession. Um, throughout there's a response and we'll begin with saying it together. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And yet we've misused it for our gain, contributed to its destruction to ensure an extravagant lifestyle, neglected its cries for restoration. And we say, the earth, the earth is, is the Lord's and everything in it. And yet we greedily deplete this gift of abundance. We take instead of receive, consume instead of give, demand instead of thank. And we say, the earth, the earth is, is the Lord's and everything, everything in it. And Lord, uh, yet our own wants have taken priority over the needs of others. Because of our indifference, species of animals and plants are becoming extinct. Because of our acts of discrimination, racialized communities live closest to the sources of pollution. Because of our selfishness, indigenous people are forced to fight for the protection of their own land. Because of our apathy, poverty-stricken areas are left with unsanitary drinking water. Because of our carelessness, bodies of water fill up with waste. And we say, the earth, the earth is, is the Lord's and, and everything, everything in it. it. And yet, Lord, we do not take responsibility for our actions or lack thereof. Instead, we are quick to point fingers to blame and accuse. Though we see the pains and hear the groans of this beaten world, we continue to pass by on the other side of the road. Creator God, Lord of the earth and everything in it, forgive us. And now, Creator God, just as you breathed life into dust, breathe anew into your people that our confession may bring your justice, peace, and hope to the once dust of this world. Creator God, you make beautiful things out of the dust. Give us the eyes to see, the voices to declare, the hands and minds to affirm as we say this truth together. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Amen. The New Testament reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay, and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Our Old Testament scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Hear now the word of God. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, 
as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you. As many as came out of the ark, I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Earth Day and church. What in the world do these two things have to do with each other? I mean, why are we Christians dedicating an entire Sunday to talk about and celebrate the earth? I get this question all the time. You see, I teach theology part-time over at Xavier, and strange as it might sound, most of the classes I teach are actually on this topic. We academics call it eco-theology, but these classes essentially just explore the Christian understanding of nature. So what our faith tradition has to say about things like forests and animals and oceans and ecosystems. I'm actually teaching a class on it right now called Theology and Ecology. And every time I teach this course, I always find myself staring at a sea of confused faces on the first day of class. Wait, one of them will inevitably say, I thought Christianity had nothing to do with the environment. Isn't Christianity just about God's love for us humans? What does it have to do with the earth? In fact, I actually thought that Christianity was about leaving the earth behind to go be with God up in heaven. To be honest, I I don't blame my students for thinking this. Sadly, it's what most Christians grow up being taught. I know it's what I grew up with, and I was a pastor's kid, for crying out loud. Christianity, we're told, is a story about God's redemption of humans. And nature, or the earth, it's just the stage, a mere prop or backdrop on which this divine human drama plays out. Friends, I believe that this is a profoundly truncated gospel, a deeply limited understanding of our faith. Because this story, as common as it is, it's far too small. You see, our God's love is way bigger than this. And our Bible tells a story that is so much larger than just us. Scripture makes this abundantly clear time and time again. There are so many passages that we could look at to see this this morning. But I think that it's in our scripture reading for today, our Old Testament scripture reading for today, in that famous story of Noah and the flood, that we get perhaps the clearest expression of just how big our story is. Now, some of you might be thinking, really? Noah and the flood? That's the one where God violently destroys all creation in response to human sin, right? some nature-friendly story. This sounds like an environmental nightmare, 
<laughs> the type of text we should be avoiding rather than reading or celebrating on Earth Day? Well, not so fast. Perhaps there is more to this story than we think. The story of the flood does, in fact, begin with human sin. It begins, of course, with the story of the fall in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. You all know the story. Adam and Eve disobey God and eat from the tree. Sin and death enter the world, and Adam and Eve receive their punishment. They're kicked out of the garden. Women will deal with painful childbirth, and men will struggle in their work on the land. But why will people struggle with their work on the land? Well, because the earth itself, the ground, as the text puts it, is also cursed because of the fall. That's odd. It's a small yet profound detail, one that often goes unnoticed. Yes, the fall is the result of human sin, something we humans caused, but its consequences, Genesis tells us, are cosmic in scope. The fate of the human and the fate of the earth are deeply interconnected. What happens to one happens to the other. They seem to be part of the same story. Now, this interconnectedness between humans and the earth, it shouldn't really surprise us. In the previous chapter, Genesis 2, our author tells us that man himself was actually created from the earth. He was literally formed from the dust of the ground. In fact, the name Adam itself, if you didn't know, is actually a play on the Hebrew word for ground, Adama. It's thus no accident then that our author sees the consequences of Adam's sin as spilling over to all creation, affecting the very earth, the ground, Adama, from which he, Adam, came. He is, after all, dust, and to dust he shall return. And so the narrative of Genesis continues, telling us the story of how this sin continued to spread all throughout the earth. But it's precisely this all throughout the earth dimension of the story that I want to draw your attention to this morning. You see, we all know the stories that come after Adam and Eve. Stories like Cain and Abel, stories like the Tower of Babel. We've heard them a thousand times. And we know that these stories are about the birth of civilization and how as civilization grew, so did human sin. And we know that it's precisely these stories about the spread of sin, about sin becoming so toxic, so violent, so pervasive, that ultimately sets the stage for why God eventually sends the great flood. Yet what we often miss, and I don't know how we miss it, is that this sin that so greatly grieved the heart of God wasn't just between us humans, but also between humans and the earth. We saw this, of course, with Adam and Eve and the curse on the ground, but we don't just see it there. The pattern continues. Cain murders Abel. What have you done, declares the Lord? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. The message of Genesis seems to be clear. Sin hasn't just corrupted us. Somehow it's corrupted everything, all of creation. And this is the reason God sends the flood. Don't take my word for it. Just hear the author of our text himself as he explains the state of things before God sends the rain. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. Notice this repetition here. It's borderline awkward. The earth, the earth, the earth, the earth. 
But this repetition isn't accidental, of course. It never is. The author is trying to tell us something. And what he's telling us is this. God simply could not stand, simply could not bear to see the earth suffer anymore. It was just too much. Sin and violence had completely wrecked not just humanity, but every good thing God had created. Oh, how far the world had strayed from God's original intent for it, from that sacred seventh day, the Sabbath, where God and all that God created rested in perfect peace and harmony. Now, I need to be honest with you and admit that I struggle. I really struggle with how our text portrays God choosing to address this cosmic problem. I mean, how could God's very love for the world lead God to destroy it as a means to cleanse and recreate it? Isn't the earth itself here innocent, right? Just a victim of human sin? How is this fair? How could God do this? These are difficult questions, and I don't have any easy answers. There is a fundamental ambiguity about this story, as there is with most ecological texts in the Bible. But beneath the ambiguity, what this story makes clear, what I think this story makes abundantly clear, is that God not only hears and responds to our cries, but to the cries of the earth. Indeed, these are the cries that Paul is talking about in our New Testament reading for today. The creation, subject, subjected to frustration. And here Paul is talking about the fall, by the way. The creation is groaning. It's eagerly awaiting, crying out for its liberation. And what we learn from our story this morning is that this liberation, it will come. Because God has made a commitment, a promise to everything God created and is willing to do whatever it takes to keep that promise. This promise, of course, is made explicit in the events that follow immediately after the flood. After 40 days and 40 nights, we're told that God remembers Noah and the animals. Yes, let's not forget about the animals. God certainly didn't. After all, it wasn't just Noah and his family on that ark. The waters subside, Noah builds an altar, and with a rainbow in the sky, God makes a promise. As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you, with all flesh that is on the earth. A covenant with all flesh. Yes, this covenant is first and foremost about God's promise to never again flood the earth. It seems that God too comes to share our concern and trouble with a strategy of redemption through destruction. Thank God. But I also think that this covenant is much bigger than that. It's not just about the flood. No, for me, it's what this whole story from beginning to end is all about. It's a story about God's commitment to and promise to deliver all flesh, all that God created from the tyranny of sin. In fact, I think, and what I want to propose to you this morning, is that this idea, a covenant with all flesh, is actually what the whole Christian story is all about. It's not just at the center of Noah and the flood. No, it's at the center of our faith, the center of everything we Christians hope for and trust in. Friends, we are people of the covenant. We believe that God, in God's great mercy, has freely and graciously chosen us committed to us and promised to rescue and redeem us from the power of sin. 
Yet what we forget, what we so easily lose sight of, is that it's not just us that God has made a covenant with, but all flesh. We Christians should know better. After all, we're not just people of the covenant. We're people of the incarnation. We know, that is, that this covenant is ultimately revealed in the person and work of Jesus, an event where God freely chose to take on flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Brothers and sisters, we of all people, we who believe that God so loved flesh, that God became it in order to redeem it, we should know that a covenant with flesh truly is at the center of our faith. Unfortunately, many of us don't see it that way. Sadly, we somehow think that the point of the incarnation, the turning point of history, is not that God became flesh, but that God became human. As familiar as that might sound, this is actually a profound distortion of our faith. You see, the biblical word flesh, sarks in Greek and basar in Hebrew, it's not a synonym for human. We have a Greek word for human. No, flesh in the biblical tradition simply refers to raw materiality, to anything that is finite or vulnerable. Flesh is just a reference to anything that exists. This means that in the incarnation, God, in becoming flesh, wasn't just taking on humanity, but God was taking on all of reality. The birds, the trees, the mountains, you name it. The early church knew this. Just ask Irenaeus, Athanasius, or John of the Cross. You see, they knew that the Christ event was a cosmic event. Theologians now call it deep incarnation. And the idea here is that through the incarnation, God assumed not just the human condition, but flesh, the creaturely condition. And why did God do this? So as to move forward what God has been doing all along, transforming the entire cosmos into a new heaven and a new earth. The resurrected body of Jesus is not just a promise for our future. It's a pledge to all creation. In fact, this is precisely why we Christians are so committed to, so adamant about the physical, material nature of the resurrection. Resurrection is about the body. Resurrection is about the flesh. So what does Earth Day have to do with the church? Absolutely everything. In fact, the earth is so central to our faith that I think one could even argue that Christians should actually be critical of Earth Day. Why? Because every day should be Earth Day. People of the covenant, let us never forget that this story is so much bigger than us. It's not just a story about God's faithfulness to humans, although it is that. It's a story about God's faithfulness to creation, a covenant with all flesh. And a covenant, of course, is a two-way street. Yes, God will act, and God will act decisively to save God's creation. But we, too, are called to participate in this covenant. God has been, God will be, faithful to the earth. The question is, will you?
Go oh, ahead and unmute yourselves. Thank you for such a convicting and inspiring message. Amen. As we enter into prayer this morning, um, I just want to invite anyone who has particular prayer requests that they want to be sure we pray for to have a chance to say that and then um, we'll just I'll start <laughs> as we normally do and then Jono will uh, conclude our prayer time. Gracious and loving God, God of all flesh, we thank you for hearing these prayers, the prayers of your people. And we thank you, God, for your amazing love that extends all throughout time and space to all parts of creation, all of which you created and called good. God, you made a covenant with Noah and his family, with the earth and all flesh putting a rainbow in the sky to symbolize your promise of love and blessing for every single creature. And in Jesus, you fulfilled this covenant, further revealing your love for this world, this earth, and your commitment to redeeming it. As people of faith, we are called into this covenant, a covenant with all flesh that extends to all people and all creation. May we faithfully remember and always participate in that covenant. God, we pray not only for every request mentioned today, but for the healing of the earth, that present and future generations may enjoy the fruits of your beautiful creation so that all things can, can continue to glorify and praise you. Amen. Amen. So please join me now in singing our closing hymn for the beauty of the earth.
people of the covenant, go now and love the earth as God has not only loved you, but all creation. God has made a covenant with all flesh. May we join God in this glorious work of redeeming the world. Amen.